Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA A plus certification training course. And this module, we're going to talk about using the network. I'm your host, James Messer. And in this module, we're going to discuss 220 602, section 5.2, where we need to install and configure browsers. And we also need to demonstrate the ability to share network resources. We've gone through all this process of configuring our machines, setting up the network, plugging everything in. Now, how do we make use of it? How can we connect to printers? How can we connect to file shares? We need to understand how to configure our browsers properly, how to share files between devices, how to share printers, which becomes really important if you have more than more than one person needs to print to a device, and finally, how to manage Windows services, especially those that deal with the operation of the device. Let's start with configuring browsers. That's not something we often think about configuring network settings inside of a browser. We start our browser up, we connect to Google, and we're on the internet. But if you're in a large organization, there may be a number of configuration settings you need to put in your browser for it to operate properly. One of the more important ones, especially in large environments, are things like configuring a proxy. Well, what's a proxy? I'm glad you asked. A proxy is a device that is put between you and the internet. It's ideally set up to provide an extra layer of security between the inside and the outside of your network. This can also be used to speed up your communication to the internet because it will sit in the middle and it will cache pages that are hit a lot but don't change very often. So if one person goes out and goes to a website, Site, and then a person right behind them goes to the same website and the page hasn't changed, your proxy doesn't have to pull down all that information again. It just gives you a locally stored copy of that. So it can speed up things very often. The, however, to be able to use the internet and communicate, we have to tell our browser that we're using a proxy to be able to get out. So there are a number of configurations that we do. One of them is to set a configuration automatically that goes out finds the information it needs. And uh, automatic configuration will find favorites, uh, the toolbar settings, connection settings, proxy settings, important URLs, and all the security things you would need. This is great in a large environment. That means there's nothing you have to configure on the local machine. And if you ever need to add something to the favorites, you add it in one place. And the next time that machine goes out to gather those automatic configurations, it just gathers the extra favorite that you added into that list. Let's see how this is done. Every browser has their network settings in a different place. But what we'll do in this particular example is just use Internet Explorer as a good example of where things will be. Just keep in mind that depending on what browser you have, things may be in a little bit different place. Under the Tools pull down menu in Internet Explorer, under Internet Options, I have a lot of different tabs here. And the one that I'm interested in getting more information about is my connections. Now, under connections, that makes sense that this would be where our network connectivity settings are. We can configure uh, virtual private networks. We can set up internet connections. Choose settings if I need to configure a proxy server for connection. And I'm going to go under my LAN settings to see what's there. Here's where all my configs are. I can automatically detect settings. We just talked about that one and automatically going out and grabbing the information we need. I also have use automatic configuration script. Maybe there is an address, a script in a different location that will pull down the information we need that's not on the place where you would normally have your automatic settings. Or you may have to manually add a proxy server IP address in here so that it can communicate out. So you may be given an address by your administrator that has an IP address in it. I'll just put a fake one in here. And this may be using a different port number. And there's a bunch of different advanced settings as well for the different protocols that will be in use. You have to get all this information from your security manager or for whoever managed your proxy server so that you can put it in here and be able to connect to the internet properly. Normally, there's extra settings that have to be done on the proxy side to make sure that you are granted access to the internet. So in large organizations, this, this really provides a lot of functionality for management. But you need to make sure that you know where in the browser to configure it and that all of your settings in this configuration are correct for your proxy configuration. Well, if you're on a network or you've set up a network and you've connected devices together, certainly one of the primary goals is to be able to share files. The file sharing system in Microsoft Windows is relatively straightforward if you happen to know the ins and outs and a few little things along the way. The first thing to keep in mind is the type of access control that's done in Microsoft Windows. 
Uh, prior to Windows 2000 and Windows XP, and Windows 95, 98, and Windows ME, there was a type of access control called share level access control. When you created a share, when you wanted to share a folder that was on or files that were on your hard drive, you set up just a password. You didn't care who connected. You didn't care what the username was of the person who connected. All you did was set a password for it. And when somebody wanted access, they said, hey, what's the password to that share you set up? Oh, the password is pickle. The password is pizza. The password is movie. And then they got into the share. Well, the problem with that, of course, is I can set up multiple shares on my machine. I can set up different passwords for every share. Administratively, it became a nightmare to try to figure that piece out. It really wasn't designed to scale well at all. Uh, going forward in Windows 2000 and Windows XP and everything else after that is a user level share control by default. And user level assigns access to files and directories by user. So you set up a username for a person, and then you get to decide what access that user has. Can they get into my system? And then what type of permissions do they have to this directory, to that directory, or another directory? And you configure everything that way. As you can tell just by that simple explanation, it scales very easily. Easily, I could share 100 folders on my machine. And for each folder, I simply say that Harold only has access to read this one, to write to that one, or no access to another. It makes it very simple to be able to do that. There's only one username and one password for that user to get into whatever they might want to see on my machine. Now, when you want to connect to a share, the easiest way to do this is in Windows Explorer. You can also use this net use command at the command line to assign a drive letter to a share. And so there's a couple of different ways to go about doing that. I'll step through a demonstration and give you a feel for how that looks. If you know nothing about a network or the configuration or what shares happen to be out there, one of the quickest ways to get an understanding of what's going on is to have a look at the Windows Explorer. So I'm going to go right click, click my Start command and click Explore. And this pops up the Windows Explorer Start menu, along with all of the other components associated with my computer. I'm going to collapse my drive C so that you can see that I've got a number of different options out here of where I can connect to different devices, what I can do, different things available to me. One of these options is called My Network Places. And there's a few shares that have already been identified there. But I'm going to actually click on the entire network so you can see all of the different types of shared folders I could connect to. The one that you're going to be interested in seeing for the purposes of your CompTIA certification is the Microsoft Windows Network. And if I click the plus sign, it's going to list all of the work groups available to me from my computer, work groups or domains, depending on type of configuration you're in. Now, the, this particular device happens to be in the Pegasus work group. And if I click on that, I can see there's two computers in the Pegasus work group. One's called Daedalus, and one is called Prometheus. Now, those also have plus signs next to them, which means there are things that are shared on each one of those devices. And if I highlight each one of those, I expand them out, it goes across the network. And I'm going to make a little more room here so we can see it a little better. We expand those out. Uh, we can see that there are a number of other devices available out there. There are these shares available out there on these devices. The Daedalus device has a share called DVD and another one called Using the Network. The Prometheus device, which happens to be the one we're on right now, has a share called Books, a share called Presentations. Its printers and faxes are shared. And the, there is also a share for scheduled tasks. And the reason I see those is because I'm on that device. And I can see that there is a share there so that other administrative tools can access that. So already, I'm starting to see a wealth of information available just because it's my username and my password that has access to those devices. If those machines did not have my username and password in them, I would not be able to see anything. It would ask me to authenticate properly into those devices, at which time I could use my username and password, or I could use any username and password that I happen to have. These shares are easy to see and easy to, to get to. In fact, I can click on Using the Network, and you can see there are a number of documents in the Using the Network folder because that's the one we're working from right now. The DVD folder, however, I don't think I have anything in the DVD. In fact, this person has said there's a share there, but you're only able to access that network resource across the network, and you're going to want to find out from the administrator of that machine why you don't have access to that share. 
configuring the view of the shares that are available is relatively easy as well. Let's share some information on our drive. We have a C drive here, and I'm in my Professor Messer folder. Let's say that I would like to share my documents here. And inside of my documents, there's a My Music folder. I'm going to right mouse click on My Music, and there's a Sharing and Security option. Now, this My Music properties that popped up shows some very simple sharing. You have the option to share the folder on the network and type in the share name. And you get, can choose whether you'd like users to share the files. This is called simple file sharing. What would be more interesting to us is if instead of simple file sharing, we saw the normal file sharing capabilities. The way that you would see that is under the Tools pull down menu, choose Folder Options. Under your View tab, scroll all the way to the bottom. And where it says Use Simple File Sharing, uncheck that. As a CompTIA A plus professional, you're going to want to learn a lot more about the file sharing process. And you want to go into the very detailed view of file sharing. Now let's go back to my folder. And let's do some different sharing now. I'm still going to go back to my music. And I'm going to choose Sharing and Security. And notice the screen that pops up now is a little bit different. We have the option to either share or not share this folder. And we can set permissions on this. I can share this folder. And by default, it pops up with the name My Music. That sounds good. In fact, uh, we'll leave that there. We can put a comment associated with it that would show up when people were sharing. We can choose a user limit on the number of people who could access this share at a time. And I'll explain just a bit why that's important. And then there's also another section for permissions, where I can add a username. I can specify what the user might happen to be. And then I can set up permissions for that user. So I could set up Bill so that he has read and write permissions. But I could set up Mary so that she only has read permissions. It's completely up to you on how you do it. And all of the settings are now available to you now that you've disabled that simple file sharing. As you step through his, this and start working with it, start, start playing around with the configuration. Set up different users. Set up different permissions and rights. Have people from another machine try to access your device and set up different rights and permissions for them. We'll talk in just a moment about permissions, but you're able to have a lot of flexibility with what type of access people have, what they can see, and what they can do using these sharing configurations. Now that we've set up our shares to provide somebody access to our system, there's still another step. We can provide certain permissions of what someone can see on our system. Not everybody on your computer can see every file you happen to have unless you've set up the permissions that way. Even on the same computer, if you log into your computer, then you log out and somebody else logs into the same computer, by default, they don't have access to see your private files in your directory because those are yours. Those have been set up with permissions that only provide your authentication in to be able to see those files. Across the network, it works exactly the same way. If somebody's connecting to you remotely, you not only have to assign that user permission to log into your system and authenticate properly, but you now also have to assign proper permissions for that person. There are specific permissions available for folders and for files. They're a little bit different between the two, but mostly very similar. For files, I can have full control, modified, read and execute, read, write, and combinations of different pieces. Under folders, I have a similar list, but it's specific to folders. Let's look at some of these permissions, and you'll get a feel for that. When we're configuring a share, we have an option to set the permissions for people who access this folder across the network. The default username that's in here is everyone. So this is the access that everyone would have. And if I change permissions for everyone, notice I have full control, I have change, and I have read. I can also set a deny for this or an allow for this. If I set a deny for change, that means that everyone who connects to this administratively is denied the ability to change it. Even if I add another user and give that user access and say, I'd really like that user to change something, what's well, too bad? The deny takes precedence over everything. And I've already said, everyone is disallowed from changing. So you've got now a lot of flexibility and capabilities with being able to add and delete access to this. Now, if I don't choose deny, they still don't have access to it. But that means that I could add another user who then would have access to this. So that's how powerful this deny capability is. And it gives you a lot of flexibility with what you can do here. Now, beyond the share, for people who have local access to this drive, I also have all of these different settings that I can configure on a per person basis or per group basis. These are the permissions that I have. Full control, modify, read and execute, list the folder contents, read, write, and even special permissions. And if I click Advanced, you can see I can go in here and add 
any permissions available to me in this particular device. So now I've got complete control over my files, over my subfolders, and the capabilities I have for being able to assign very specific rights and permissions to these files and directories. If you're in charge of administering a machine that has multiple shares on it, or you want to share a lot of folders all at once, clicking and all the way through all those configurations and setting individual permissions and doing each one of those for tens or even hundreds of shares can be a little bit daunting. So there is a program that allows you to save, share multiple files, multiple folders from one utility. It's called sharepubw.exe. And if you run that program, it's just a simple wizard that takes you through the process of what is the directory you'd like to share and who would like to be in there. And you just step through that process very, very simply. It's something that's already built into your Windows environment. You also have the way administratively to hide shares so that as people are clicking through that list, just like I did earlier, what if you wanted to share the DVD, but you didn't want to advertise the fact that you were sharing the DVD? It's not a security function as much as it is more of an administrative function. But the way that you do that is you add a dollar sign on to the end of the share name. So what I would do is go back to that machine with the DVD shared, and I'd put the share in as DVD dollar sign. The way that you would access that share is with that extra dollar sign on the end, but it doesn't show up when people are simply browsing around the network. So if you really want to hide things away and make sure that nobody else can see that and clean up the view a little bit, it's a very easy way to do it. There are a number of administrative hidden shares already on your computer. You may not even realize it, but they're there so that people can access, administration can access your machine to see those. It's also the way that people would share printers, share files, and it's a process that just runs behind the scenes in Windows that you just never happen to see. Let's look at that wizard for sharing multiple files. I'm going to click Start and Run and Share Pub W, S H R P U B W, and hit Enter. This is the Create a Shared Folder Wizard. And if I click Next, it gives you information about the firewall and why that's important. Here's my computer name, the folder I would like to share. And let's browse my directory. I'm going to choose my shared documents and my Professor Messer documents. And I'm going to choose my music. And the share name here will call music. This is my music. And click Next. And now we get to set the permissions. Who gets access to this? All users, administrators. I can customize my permissions. And this just takes you back to that same screen you saw before with the share permissions and the security for the files that were in that directory. And we'll say uh, all users have read-only access to this. and then. I could say Finish, or I can click Run the Wizard again and create another shared folder, and I'm done. Set up a share. It's that easy. So that's a very nice administrative tool if you're one who has to do a lot of different folders. Now, if we set up a different share on here, if I run that program again under Start, Run, and run that same share, Pub W, I can also say uh, that I would like to share a different folder. In this case, I'm going to go back to my Documents folder, and I'm going to put my pictures. But my pictures, I want to be private, or at least invisible. Pictures dollar sign. And my share description is pictures. This it means that my pictures will still have read-only access for everybody out on the network. And I'll click Finish. But now it's a hidden share. I'll be able to see it, but anybody browsing around the network won't. And it's just as simple as just adding a dollar sign onto the end of the name. You don't have to do anything special at all. Sharing printers is just as easy, maybe even easier than sharing files. The way that you would share a printer is through your printer configuration. That's one of the easiest ways to do it. And then finally, connecting to it is also a relatively simple process. Let's step through that so you can get an idea from beginning to end exactly how you would not only start to share the printer, but then use it once you've shared it. We'll start our sharing process from the Control Panel. I'll click Start and Settings. And I can either go to the Printers and Faxes option here, or I can go directly to the Control Panel and choose Printers and Faxes. It takes me to exactly the same place. Now, when I'm here inside of my Printer and Faxes configuration, one of my options is Add a Printer. I can right mouse click and do the same thing as well, Add a Printer. The Add a Printer wizard pops up and says, this will help you install a printer or make printer connections, which is exactly what we'd like to do across the network. My next option is select the option that describes the printer that we would like to use. I can choose a local printer attached to this computer. That's not what we want. Or a network printer or a printer attached to another computer. That is what I would like to do. 
If we click Next, it says I can browse for a printer. I can connect directly to a device if I happen to know the share and then share that printer. Or I can connect to a printer using a home or office network with this URL. I want to browse for a printer. So I'm going to click Next. And it's going to show me my network configuration for Windows. I know that this printer is in my Pegasus work group on the Daedalus machine. And if I double click, there's my printer right there, this Brother MFC 845 CW USB printer. It's ready right now. I'm going to click Next. And it says, you're about to connect to a printer. This is automatically going, going to install a print driver. This is really simple. You don't have to have any print drivers. You don't have to have any CD-ROMs. You don't have to download anything. It's going to grab the print drivers directly from that machine. But because it's doing that, it says, this we don't know where these printer drivers came from. It might have something bad in it. Do you want to do it anyway? So you need to be very sure and you need to trust that the printer driver on that other machine is correct. And I do in this case. I'll say yes. It's now going to go through a process of installing the drivers on my machine, adding this into my list. There's my brother printer. And it says, do I want to use this printer as the default printer? Sure, why not? And it says, we're done. You've installed it. You're now access to it. And it's on the network. You can see it's a network printer because it's got this little network connection coming right out of the bottom of it. It even tells me that the toner is low in that particular printer. So now we're able to access this printer. And if we go to some of our programs, let's start Notepad, for instance. I'm going to go to my programs. Under my accessories, I'm going to choose Notepad. And we're going to put in just some sample text. I'm going to type sample text. And then let's choose Print. And it should pop up an option here. Yep, there's my brother printer. And if I click the Print button, it's now going to send it off to that network printer. Even though I'm not physically attached to that printer, it's now going to print it out on that printer device. And behind the scenes, actually across the room, I have a printer. And it's now printing off my sheet of paper that shows sample text at the top of it. And that's now confirmed for me that that has indeed worked properly. Now, if you connected to this printer and it wasn't working properly, I'm going to say no. I'm going to right mouse click here. You have the option here, you can hear it printing in the background, of going to my properties because from here I can print a test page. So you have now some options of different things to print so you can help troubleshoot what's going on with your printer. And you can connect to it over the network and use it as if it was a locally attached device. There are a number of services that run behind the scenes. They keep track of a lot of things going on on the network. There's services for your printer. There's services for other configurations on your machine. And all of these Windows services can be administered from one place where we start and stop or restart different services on our machine. Uh, just the small list of services. There's one that manages the process of your machine acting as a server. There's another completely different process that administers and manages the process of your computer acting as a workstation. On other machines, you could see a DHCP server service, although that's not one that's normally on people's workstations. One that is often used, however, is the print spooler service. There's also some others that are used on the network configuration, such as the messenger service and the browser service. And all of these can be managed and configured from the Services option in your Control Panel. We get to our Services from our Start menu under the Settings and Control Panel. All of the settings for all of our services are part of the Administrative Tools option. So we'll double click on that. And inside Administrative Tools is Services. And if I double click, it will bring up a list of all the services running on this machine. I'm going to click the Standard option here just so we can have more text to work with. And you can see it lists out all of the services on my machine. And notice there are quite a few. I'm going to scroll down. I've got a lot of services that are running just in this very simple workstation. I don't have very much running here at all. It gives me a description of what the service is. So if you're wondering what this service actually does, you can have a nice long description that explains to you, here's the process. If you turn this off, it's going to affect these features. You'll get a status on whether the service is running or not. You'll know whether on startup, if it's meant to log in automatically, if it's meant to be disabled automatically, or if it's a manual process. You can also see who it's logging in as. Is it logging in as the local system, or is it logging in as a different specialized network service or some other username or password? So you've got a lot of capabilities here. If you're finding that you're having problems with your printing, you may want to check to make sure the print spooler is actually running. You'll see that it is indeed started right now. And if I double click, it brings up my property screen. And then from here, I can stop the spooler. 
I can wait till it stops on my screen, and I can restart it. So if you think your problem is that you're printing to this printer and it's stuck on the hard drive, it's not getting out to the printer, you may think that perhaps the print spooler is having a problem. It's hung up a little bit, and just by stopping and starting it again, now you may be able to get that printer working. All of your services can be handled exactly the same way. You can right mouse click on any of these and go into the properties or use the toolbar across the top to manually stop or one button will automatically restart the service. It'll stop it and then start it again. So you can flip through this services view and start changing and modifying different things. You can turn off different services, turn on different services. But keep in mind, turning off or disabling certain services may cause parts of your system not to work properly. So make sure if you make any major changes to this that you have a pretty good idea of what to do. But it is a nice centralized place to be able to manage any of these services that are normally running behind the scenes that you never happen to see. In review, we've gone through a lot about how to use the network. We've configured the proxy settings inside of our Internet Explorer browser. We've shared files over the network. We've configured our access control and permissions for that. I've gone through a set of printer sharing, just how easy it is to get an extra driver, a new driver loaded on your computer so you can share a printer over the network. And finally, we've looked at managing some of the services that are running behind the scenes on our Windows workstation. For more free a videos, to participate in our message boards and much, much more, you can visit our website, freeaplus.com.